On this Sunday night, the major meeting to mend our public health care system as Canada's premiers head to Ottawa to hammer out a deal. And if the federal government wants to join me in saving that system, uh, they have a willing partner. The recommendations, the roadblocks, and the non-negotiables. Ballooning tensions, Beijing's strong reaction and how it's further puncturing China-U.S. relations. Canada's cooling car market, how a stabilizing supply chain is changing the price of used vehicles. And from the strange but true file, a yacht, a dead fish, and the house from the Goonies. We put together two and two that it was the same guy. How they're linked to the arrest of a BC fishing fugitive. Global National with Farah Nasser. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. In less than 48 hours, a critical meeting will take place in Ottawa that could determine the future of Canada's health care system. At the table, Canada's 13 premiers and the prime minister, who are meeting for the first time face to face since before the pandemic. Now, each province has its own story about why the system isn't working, but they all want the same thing. More money from Ottawa. Billions of tax dollars are on the line, as is a system in crisis mode. Megan King reports on the expectations and the hard lines ahead of the first minister's meeting on Tuesday. This pop-up primary care clinic is one of the many ways innovation comes into play when health care is in crisis. So I have about 2,000 patients in my practice and I can't take on new patients. And we field calls every day from people looking for a family doctor. We feel really terrible about it. Um, so this is kind of my way of contributing. We need to think about the system where we are today, but we also need to think of where we will be tomorrow. Because part of it is, you know, our needs are different from what we may have designed a few years ago, so we need to continue to re-evaluate even as we plan for the future. That point reiterated by Nova Scotia's Premier as he readies for a trip to Ottawa with Canada's 12 other Premiers to hammer out a health care funding deal with Prime Minister Trudeau. The First Ministers have been calling for the meeting for over two years, demanding the federal share of health care costs jump from 22 to 35 percent. That's an increase that would amount to about $28 billion. The changes that are really required are not limited to things that uh, a single province can just chip away at. Uh, they're national issues. Uh, I believe in our, our, our public system. If the federal government wants to join me in saving that system, uh, they have a willing partner. Nova Scotia is all in on that. A different tone than that of premiers in Ontario, Saskatchewan and Alberta who have opened the door to health care privatization through expanding partnerships. Our priorities may be slightly different in Saskatchewan than they might be in, let's say, Newfoundland or Nova Scotia. Uh, and again, possibly even different in British Columbia. BC's premier says he's optimistic, ready to discuss funding, retention of staff and improved care. We're very much looking forward to hear the proposal from the uh, Prime Minister about how we're going to address this issue of uh, the federal government being a strong partner in ensuring that health care is there for British Columbians. Trudeau says he won't be signing any deals with the premiers at Tuesday's meeting, instead focusing on improving patient outcome. And the federal finance minister, Christia Freeland, has made it known that the government is in a tight fiscal environment heading into these discussions. Megan King, Global News. To the U.S. now, a day after a suspected Chinese surveillance balloon was shot down by a military jet, the job has now begun of examining debris from the device to figure out what intelligence it gathered and beamed back to China while it flew over some top-secret military sites. And as Jennifer Johnson reports, Beijing is already firing back, threatening repercussions. They just shot it. Some debris from the downed Chinese spy balloon is now being examined by U.S. military forensics teams. See the smoke coming from it? As China threatens to retaliate. In a statement, China's Ministry of Foreign Affairs criticized the U.S. for an obvious overreaction and serious violation of international practice, further escalating an already tense situation. Clearly, this was an attempt by China to gather information to defeat our command and control of our sensitive missile defense and nuclear weapon sites. Questions remain as to why the balloon wasn't brought down within minutes of entering U.S. airspace last week. It was first detected north of the Aleutian Islands on January 28th. Republicans are pointing the finger directly at U.S. President Joe Biden, who was advised civilians could be hurt if the balloon was shot down over populated areas. He allowed a full week 
for the Chinese to conduct spying operations over the United States over sensitive military installations. U.S.-China relations are already strained. Disputes over Beijing's support of Russia and its war against Ukraine and military threats against Taiwan and Japan. Analysts say this now proves to Americans that China is a real threat. It showed the extent of China's spying program and what they're willing to do to gather intelligence from the United States. The Pentagon says U.S. defense took steps to block the balloon's spying capabilities. Military jets shot down the surveillance balloon off the coast of South Carolina Saturday afternoon after it traveled across at least 11 states. Suddenly we saw something take off from the jet and knew it was a missile and you could see the explosion. Debris from the balloon spread across 11 kilometers. Local residents are being warned some of it may float ashore. This is obviously a, a federal investigation. Uh, we don't want to tamper with any evidence. The evidence may be critical, although the U.S. military has already concluded the balloon's technology didn't give the Chinese significant intelligence beyond what it can already obtain from satellites. But the fallout for U.S.-Chinese relations will be much more damaging. Jennifer Johnson, Global News, Washington. Iran's Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khamenei has pardoned thousands of prisoners, including some who were arrested in the country's most recent anti-government protests. Khamenei agreed to pardon following a request by the head of the judiciary, who said many of the young people swept up by the protests are remorseful and they're not against the Islamic Republic. But not all the prisoners met the conditions of release, including any dual nationals and those accused of corruption on earth. Some of them still face execution. According to human rights groups, up to 20,000 people were arrested since the protests began in September, many of them teens and young adults with no political affiliation. Former Pakistani President Pervez Musharraf has died in self-imposed exile in Dubai. The 79-year-old died in hospital after a lengthy illness. Musharraf ruled Pakistan for nearly a decade after seizing power in a coup in 1999. He became a key ally of the United States after the 9-11 terror attacks. Musharraf went into exile after stepping down in 2008. He was arrested and charged with high treason when he returned in 2013. The ruling was later overturned. He left Pakistan for Dubai in 2016 to seek medical treatment. Protests in Peru are growing bolder and more violent. The civil and political crisis there shows no signs of slowing down nearly two months after it started. But now Peru's embattled president is offering an olive branch of sorts by promising elections before the end of the year. But critics wonder if it'll be enough to end street battles that have left dozens dead. Mike Trolley reports. With every bottle rocket flung at police in Peru's capital, the divide within the Andean country deepens. The Congress doesn't represent us, says this protester. We have total inequality. The millionaires have all the power. They have justice, but the poor people don't. It's a complicated situation. The largely indigenous protesters are angry. Former leftist president Pedro Castillo was impeached in December. They're demanding his replacement, Dina Boluarte, resigns, along with new elections and constitutional reform. Boluarte, who initially refused to cave to their demands, has now proposed elections for October. Put aside party interests, she says. It's time to think of Peru. We cannot plunge the country into uncertainty and anxiety. But Peru, it appears, is already there. For the last eight weeks, protesters have blocked roads and airports, burned buildings, and impacted the second largest copper producer in the world from transporting its goods. Tourism has also been affected, with Canada calling the situation volatile and urging non-essential travel be avoided. Peru's Congress has debated solutions, but with 13 different parties represented in Parliament, bickering has overshadowed any hope of consensus and compromise. We have dysfunction in Parliament, says this congressman. The population is punishing us for our inability to agree. An agreed-upon election would be a start, but Peru has far deeper issues to resolve. Mike Drolet, Global News.
Pope Francis has completed his trip to parts of Africa with an open-air mass in South Sudan's capital, Juba. In his message to the thousands who gathered, Francis called for the country to build relations on peace and steer away from the country's violent past. The visit was the Pope's first visit to the DRC and South Sudan, but his 10th visit to the continent. And part of this visit's significance was in its partnership between faiths, with leaders of the Catholic, Anglican and Reformed traditions all taking part. A degree and a job don't always go hand in hand. Coming up, why black Canadians are often forced to work in jobs that they're highly overqualified for. The 2021 census is revealing a big divide when it comes to education levels in the workforce. Data shows black Canadians are more likely than any other group to be overqualified for their jobs. Kyle Benning explains. The Canadian economy has seen labour force issues as it's re-emerged from the COVID-19 pandemic. But for Canada's black population, workforce problems are seen as systemic. Agape Gassessa learned it firsthand as a team. Having to um, lean on community organizations and social services to be able to navigate and figure my way out in this country um, has been, was a challenge. Black Canadians are the most overqualified racialized group when it comes to employment. That according to 2021 census data recently released by Statistics Canada. The average overqualification rate is 11%, but for black Canadians, it's 16%. Even when you put in all of the different controls and factors that tend to contribute to differences in jobs and in wages, it does not fully explain these kinds of disparities. Statistics Canada considers overqualification as people who have reached a bachelor's degree or higher from a post-secondary institution but are working jobs that require a high school diploma. For other racialized groups like South Asians and Latin Americans, Stats Canada noted they had higher overqualification rates because of accreditation issues for degrees from international universities. But for Canada's black population, it didn't matter whether it was a recent immigrant or a settled Canadian, the rate of overqualification remained around 16%. Carl James is a York University professor who has researched education and heritage. He says a societal shift is needed so black graduates can reach their full potential. What message are we giving to the student? How might young people read that and, and as, uh, as possible uh, to their detriment? These barriers are what convinced Cassessa to work at the C Centre for Young Black Professionals in Toronto. But she says until that shift happens, the cycle will continue. There's also this facade and this carrot dangled that says, like, we're inclusive, we want to, to do better and we... Um, you know, we everyone is able to kind of meet their dreams here. And that's just systemically not true. Kyle Benning, Global News. In the market for a car ahead, we'll tell you why buying used might be a better bargain, but there's a catch. If you're planning to get a new vehicle for yourself and maybe save some cash by buying used, you also might want to have a little more patience. After riding high on a spike in sales over the last few years, there are signs the used car market is cooling down. And that could mean relief for Canadians looking for better bargains. Vanessa Wright explains. If you purchased a car during the pandemic, it might have been a tougher process than usual. The new car market, you can't even get them. You got to pre-order, wait three, four, five, six months to a year to get a car. The problem is twofold. New car manufacturers fell behind on production due to a shortage of important car parts like microchips and batteries. Customers began experiencing extended wait times on orders with no breaks in the price. So the new car purchase experience, which should be a very exciting, fun experience, became more like ordering a meal. And that really was removing a lot of the excitement that would go into the purchase and also removing the control by the customer and more so placing it right back on the manufacturers of, the, of each brand. The lack of supply drove up the price of used cars as a result. They were able to offer customers an older model of a car they wanted that was gently used but readily available. 
The big surprise at the beginning was the fact that the uh, used market went so high due to that lack of inventory and that supply and demand. This won't be the case for long, though, if projections hold true. Electric automakers like Tesla are quickly solving issues they faced during the pandemic. And thanks to the law of economics, that means a natural dip in the prices for used cars. We will see the, uh, the used vehicle market uh, soften and, and decline in Canada. Um, but you know what? It's more of a return to normal. It's, it's not a crash. It's just cooling off past the peak. And frankly, it's just a return to more of a normal business cycle, business environment. The decrease in used car prices is projected to come in the middle of the year. Experts are saying the best thing for Canadians to do right now is just wait. That is if you can afford to. Vanessa Wright, Global News, Halifax. Next, we've got a fisherman's tale you have to see to believe. An unusual case has left police scratching their heads on both sides of the Canada-U.S. border. Last week, a 36-year-old man wanted in B.C. was detained all the way in Oregon. That wasn't before he drew plenty of questions over how he got there and a daring rescue that led to his arrest. Now, this is a bizarre story straight out of the movies. In fact, it even involves one, as Jasmine Bala reports. The mouth of the Columbia River, known as the graveyard of the Pacific. It was a mayday call over the radio. This boat, its next victim. At that time, various Coast Guard assets were put into motion. Including students from the Coast Guard's Advanced Helicopter Rescue School who were training nearby. The conditions on scene uh, were approximately 20-foot seas and extremely heavy winds. At about 10.40 a.m., a trainee jumped into the water, swimming to the boat, seconds before it capsized. Uh, he was brought back to Air Station Astoria, and uh, he was mildly hypothermic and you know, suffered some minor injuries. Back on shore, the man was taken to hospital, and the rescue swimmer no longer just a trainee. And actually within a few hours of coming back on uh, shore, graduated from the school. So it's a heck of a graduation day and a heck of a first rescue to kick off his career. And the Mariner was released from hospital, but that's when things took a turn. We put together two and two that it was the same guy, and we have since learned that he stole a boat uh, from the port of Astoria. But there's more. Only a couple days earlier, another incident involving the same man and a local landmark in town, a home that starred in a popular movie. He went up to the Goonies house, covered the cameras with stickers, put a fish on the porch and then was dancing around the property. And it doesn't end there. Jericho Labonte is wanted on BC wide warrants. Victoria police putting out this poster only two weeks ago. The charges against him, criminal harassment, mischief and three counts of failure to comply. The charges are adding up the longer he's out. And unfortunately the hospital, he uh, was released from the hospital before we connected the dots and realized that it was the same person. But the story finally reached a conclusion late Friday night. Labonte was arrested, ending a bizarre series of events that even this veteran police chief No, I cannot say that I have. has never seen before. Jazambala, Global News. What a story. And that's Global National for this Sunday night. I'm Farah Nasser, and on behalf of our whole crew here on Global National, I want to thank you so much for spending part of your evening with us. Tonight's Your Canada is Indian Head, Saskatchewan. We love seeing your Canada, so please keep emailing us those photos to viewers at globalnational.com. Donna will be back with you tomorrow. Until next time, take care of yourselves and take care of each other. Good night.